Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Sibling Leadership Network Conference. I'm so excited to see you all. It's so great to see everyone put in the chat box where they're from. We have people from all over and how you're all feeling today. A lot of people feel, feeling excited, curious, um, you know, just ready for the day. Yesterday was an amazing day with our pre-conference workshops and then learning about the sibling movement and having a sibling happy hour where we got to connect and create community. We also got a lot of great information from the breakout sessions and then ended with a wonderful session to learn mindfulness techniques. I really felt our conference theme, which is strength through connection. This community includes siblings from across the country and around the world. As a group, our SIB friends are the people who really understand and get it. With this strength through connection, we're creating a community of caring. We also have many sibling supporters that are part of our community. Sibling supporters include everyone who, while they may not be a SIB themselves, they understand the importance of supporting siblings. This includes parents, people with disabilities, family members, professionals, friends, and our partners and spouses. We love our sibling supporters and all of you know how to support us well. We do ask our sibling supporters to be aware that our conference is one of the only spaces where sibling voices and perspectives are at the center. We ask that you keep this in mind. And while you're welcome to participate, we ask that you be mindful to allow this space for siblings that attend. I wanna review a few housekeeping items. We are on Zoom and we have it set up so that we can all see each other to foster a better sense of community. Please be respectful of each other and use good Zoom etiquette. During the speaker sessions, all participants will be muted. During any interactive portions, you can type in the chat box or raise your hand and you'll be unmuted to ask your question verbally. During sharing times, you'll be able to unmute yourself. When, when you're not talking, please mute yourself to avoid any background noise. We have handouts that are available for some sessions. Speakers may choose to include handouts here, and this folder is growing, um, and you can check back throughout the conference and after the conference. See the links in the chat box, and also a link to the conference program that provides detailed information about the sessions. We are so excited to have so many people attend our conference this year. We have over 275 people registered for our conference between the pre-conference, day one and two, our special event and the post-conference sessions. Attendees are from 35 states and 13 countries, including Rwanda, India, Japan, Portugal, Kenya, Nigeria, Slovenia, Ireland, Canada, Australia, Taiwan, the United Kingdom, and Brazil. We have 30 friends from Canada through the generous support of our colleagues from the Sibling Collaborative. We're going to now launch a quick poll. We have people who have been to an SLN conference before and people who are new to the SLN conference. We wanna see how many people are first timers and how many people have been to all eight SLN conferences um, and how many in between. If you can't quite remember, make your best guess. And so go ahead and take a minute to respond to the poll. We'll give it a minute and then we'll see the results. So go ahead and uh, put in your responses. And I'm gonna end the poll now and show the results. We have 65% of our, our attendees are first timers. We have a lot of second timers. And then 3% are have been here for all eight conferences. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Throughout our conference, you can feel free to share pictures or comments using the hashtag 2021SLN conference. We are a growing community of siblings and sibling supporters. Our goal is to provide siblings and people who care about siblings with the same kind of information and support that we're sharing throughout this conference all year long. 
We want to keep building these connections and conversations so that no one is alone on their sibling journey. We have rolled out a new membership for SLN. And I want to invite each of you, if you haven't already, to become an official member of the SLN. It's just $30 for a two-year membership. To become a member, simply sign up at the link in the chat box. Today, on day two of the conference, we have a great lineup planned. Some of you may have started out with yoga. And next, we're gonna start with our amazing keynote presentation and then go into small groups for engaging discussions where we'll have time for each of you to share. Then we have a fabulous sibling panel where we'll hear from siblings with a range of perspectives about their experiences. After the panel, we'll divide up into small groups so each of you can share some of your stories and learn from each other. Next, we have four great topics for breakout sessions and then 10 amazing table talks for you to choose from. This evening, we have a special event called Dinner with Don Meyer, who is often considered the father of sibling support, and movie night with sibling filmmaker Susan Hamovich. Cook along with Don and then enjoy your delicious pasta putinesca while watching the movie. There's still time to register and dash out and get your ingredients if you haven't already. Also, we have a great lineup of post-conference workshops on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evening, and it's not too late to sign up. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that today is Juneteenth, an important day in history that has come to represent freedom and community. The SLN celebrates both of these values as we prioritize building a truly inclusive sibling community. This means creating a safe space where siblings who are black, indigenous, and other people of color, and siblings from other traditionally marginalized, underrepresented communities can join together to share stories, learn about resources, and receive information, validation, and support. The SLN Equity and Inclusion Scholarship Fund was launched in April to remove financial barriers for siblings from all walks of life to attend our national conference. Through the generosity of donors, 30 scholarships have been provided to people from 14 different states and five different countries. To find out more and contribute to the SLN's Equity and Inclusion Scholarship Fund so we can provide additional opportunities, please click on the link in the chat box. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Lisa Matthews. Lisa has served on the past two conference planning committees and has been on the SLN Board of Directors since 2019. And she's been such a valuable member of our board. Lisa is our DC chapter representative and she has helped our national organization grow and develop in many ways. Almost exactly one year ago after the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Lisa wrote a poignant personal story about her brother and the heartbreaking realities of how social injustice constantly threatens the safety and well being of people of color with disabilities and those who love them. We cannot fix what we are unwilling to face, Lisa wrote, and called upon all of us to engage bravely in the, the uncomfortable conversations that must happen if we are to be part of systemic change that results in true inclusion and social justice for all. Lisa has been a leader in launching four BIPOC sibling roundtables since November of 2020. These roundtables have featured remarkable individuals who have shared their experiences and perspectives as Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who are navigating life as siblings of people with disabilities. Lisa has collaborated with our other SLN board member, the extraordinary, extraordinary Emily Hall of the Sibling Support Project, and helped us forge a new and important partnership with Denise Dorch of Special Needs Siblings, a tremendous family support organization based in Georgia. Lisa has provided leadership in helping to create a conference that is welcoming to everyone. And she was instrumental in the development of our SLN Equity and Inclusion Scholarship Fund. I am grateful to have Lisa as a colleague and friend. I have learned that when Lisa shares one of her great ideas, my job is to say yes. And I'm so glad that when we asked her to be this year's keynote speaker, she said yes. It's an honor and a privilege to share with all of you Lisa's keynote presentation. 
After the video, Lisa will take live questions from the audience. Without further ado, Lisa Matthews. Hi, and welcome everyone to the 2021 Sibling Leadership Network Conference. And thanks to the conference committee for inviting me to speak today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the suspicious date, June 19th, or as many of us know this date as Juneteenth. Juneteenth is the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States. Dating back to 1865, it was on June 19th that the Union soldiers, led by Major General Gordon Granger, landed in Galveston, Texas with news that the war had ended and that the enslaved were now free. Significantly, Granger's declaration was delivered two and a half years after President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which had very little impact in Texas. There are different explanations for this delay, but for now, let's just say that Juneteenth was and is a real cause for celebration for people across the nation and around the world who believe in and support freedom. It is only fitting that today we come together for another celebration of human fortitude the celebration of the strength in our connections as siblings of people with disabilities and people who care about siblings. It is truly an honor to speak about this year's conference theme, Strength Through Connection, and to share with everyone today a bit of my sibling story. While this may be my first keynote address, it is certainly not my first time attending this conference. 14 years ago, after desperate online search in varied order and combinations of sibling, support, disability in Washington, DC, I found myself at the Renaissance Hotel at a conference of brothers and sisters who had siblings with disabilities. Now, as it turns out, it was one of the very first SLN conferences. I was excited to have found a space for siblings who shared a desire to be heard and understood and a mission to enable all siblings to have a seat at the table to advocate, shape policy, and protect the rights for their loved ones. For me, this was a personal mission. Three years prior, in 2004, my brother Mike, who is 11 months younger than me and is diagnosed with autism, faced criminal charges resulting from an incident at home with our mom. And what started as a mundane family dispute quickly escalated. Now, I'm sure that many of you who have siblings like Mike that struggle to express themselves, regulate their emotions and exercise their independence can understand. I did not live there during this incident. And at that time, our mother managed all of Mike's services and pretty much every aspect of his daily life. I can recall my mother telling me that these officers were taking Mike temporarily to defuse the situation at home and would return him when their shift ended. These officers never brought Mike back home. And what was to follow was the most 24 grueling hours for our family. This breach of trust with the police resulted in Mike having a criminal record. And as we all know, a criminal record for a black man can lead to so many serious problems. Combined with the fact that Mike has a disability and is at even a greater risk to be misunderstood and mistreated by the judicial system and so many others. This was a grave situation. I knew then that I had to come off the sidelines and figure out how to help my family. The seriousness of this situation forced me to think about what was to come of Mike's future as a black man with a disability and a criminal record. I also had to come to terms with our mother's limitations and begin to navigate two very complex institutions, the judicial system and a disability service world. And I'd like to say that I accepted this role with courage, but the truth is it was from a place of fear that I took this on. At this time in my life, I was a black woman determined to help the people I love, but I had so much uncertainty in finding my own voice. So with no clue on how to get started, I did what most people would have done. I went to Google. The one word that defined this for me more than anything was the, was the diagnosis, autism. I wanted to find support to better understand autism and its impact. I wanted to connect with other people who were walking similar paths. 
strength through connection. What I found was a family organization led primarily by African-American parents who worked tirelessly since the Forest Haven days when several residents of a live-in facility for people with disabilities in Maryland died from mistreatment to create a system of change for their loved ones. And what I learned from these parents who were similar in age to my mother truly helped me appreciate my mom's perspective and her efforts to support my brother. It was then that I realized that she was doing the best she knew how and that accepting the crumbs given to her for services for my brother was better than nothing. And I knew then that the system had to change for my family and families like ours who needed and deserved more than crumbs. I immediately took on an active role with the parents group and created a newsletter for DC family members, service providers and the city council. On its pages, we shared stories to further educate and promote awareness among the community about the needs of autism for individuals and their families, strength through connection. Being part of this organization made me want to learn about other supports for a broader range of individuals with disabilities and their loved ones. I found an organization that offered respite for families provided through volunteers who facilitated recreational activities for people with disabilities. I became a coach with this organization and for nearly five years, I helped run this program and grow it from serving four families to expanding across the metropolitan DC area. And what I learned most during this experience was about the tremendous powerful connection forged by families of different generations, races, socioeconomic backgrounds, who all had one thing in common, the goal of supporting their loved one with a disability. This understanding is one of the reasons that I am here today and so hopeful about the future for all of us. Strength through connection. The respite program was the first place I got to meet other siblings. And it was during that time I realized I had not tapped into my own understanding and longing to connect with adult siblings who could relate to my experience. So back to Google I went, and soon thereafter, I was sitting in a conference room at the Renaissance Hotel. At that early SLN conference, I recall listening to powerful sibling stories, seeing representation across many states, and feeling in awe how connected I felt to some of the presenters whose stories echoed the narrative of my own in so many ways. And yet, I left this event feeling so alone. No one likely even remember I was there, but many in attendance will recall the most notable presenter, a mouse that made an appearance running around the back of the breakout room during the last day of the conference. And while that's a funny memory and one that marks my attendance at this conference, I unfortunately left the event without a single business card or any means of executing the intended purpose of me being there to connect with other adult siblings. This was the beginning of my sibling journey. While the sibling connection was strong, there were differences that separated us. Most notably, there were not a lot of people at that conference who looked like me. As one of the only people of color there, I did not feel comfortable approaching anyone and sharing the intimate details of my story. 14 years later, here I am sharing my story with all of you. And you may wonder the question that I ask myself often these days, how did we get here? Well, for starters, that first conference was a springboard for me into the sibling community. While I did not have a bonding experience there, I did feel that the resources they provided were so invaluable. I was able to join SIPnet online listserv. Thank you, Sibling Support Project where I eventually found other siblings of people with disabilities in Washington, DC, looking to form their own community. Finally, I thought, if this organization is in DC, there surely has to be other siblings who look like me. Once again, I found myself to be the only person of color and I struggled to understand why. What was unique about my family to keep bringing me to this space? What I can say, is that DC SIBS, which eventually became a chapter of the National Sibling Leadership Network, 
became a big part of my community of supports over the years. Like many of you, connecting with sibling community has established lifelong friendships for me. Strength through connection. Well over 10 years now, this group has helped me in ways I never imagined possible. Sibs just get it. Challenges I had with work, family, the lifts that we go through to be cheerleaders for one another and encourage each other for the many milestones in our lives. Many members of this group were doing work in the disability service system, and I appreciated the opinions and resources offered as I continued to work through issues to support my brother and my family. In preparing to write this speech, I was invited to think about how I became part of the sibling community and why I continue to show up year after year, meeting after meeting, despite being one of the only people of color in it. My rationale for always returning to the sibling community has been that social connection I craved in being around others who had similar experiences and could give me the gut checks I needed at times when I struggled with boundaries and balance. Here I have found the encouragement and support in navigating overwhelming and sometimes oppressive systems in order to protect and care for my family. As a member of the sibling community, I've become more self-assured and have began using the power of my voice to make an impact to improve the lives of others. I am a graduate of the DC Advocacy Partners Program, which many of you know as the Partners in Policy Making, a program that teaches individuals in the community to become a catalyst for systems change. In 2015, I was appointed by the mayor to serve as a member of the DC Developmental Disabilities Council and to serve on its state plan implementation committee. I also serve on boards that focus on issues such as community integration for individuals with disabilities, homelessness, empowering women and their children in transition and providing support for at-risk youth. And of course, I'm proud to represent the DC chapter of the Sibling Leadership Network on its board of directors. By building this tribe that includes both parent and sibling organizations, I've also become empowered with the capacity to help the people that are most important to me, my brother and my family. I've worked with my brother to customize his services over the years to allow him to work, receive personal therapy ser services, as well as having a direct support staff person. This has meant the world to me and to see Mike thrive and ask for what he wants rather than accepting what others offer through their lens has meant the world to me. After years of advocacy and tireless effort, I was able to have Mike's criminal record expunged in 2010. I've also learned about boundaries and respecting my own to protect my health and well being. Now, this was not an easy path. And over the years, I've had to let go of the person I thought I was in order to find myself for the very first time. This has required me to leave a job of nearly 20 years and disrupting my sense of security as I knew it. It entailed the end of significant relationships, which included stepping back from my supportive role with Mike. Today, I'm not as active in Mike's day-to-day -day service needs but I do remain in the loop with his providers because I know that I will always be a significant part of his life. Establishing boundaries has afforded me an opportunity to advance professionally and to reimagine where I can be of service in my community. Which brings me here today with all of you at this amazing virtual gathering of siblings, family members, and professionals across the United States. Strength through connection. One of my passions has become ensuring that siblings of color know that the sibling community is a space for all of us. Now as chance or the universe would have it, in late 2020, I was asked to represent the Sibling Leadership Network to co-host some groundbreaking events with the Sibling Support Project and the Special Needs Siblings organizations that share the mission of supporting all siblings, including and especially siblings of color. In partnership, we have hosted si siblings roundtables for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who have brothers and sisters with disabilities. 
These events have given BIPOC siblings a platform to share their insights and learn more about the existing sibling organizations and supports. What I'm learning through the BIPOC sibling roundtables we host is that many siblings of color grow up never knowing that there are other siblings with a brother or sister with a disability. We have lived in silos trying to understand the challenges that we and our families face. And many of us don't know that there's a support system out there uniquely designed just for us. It is my sincere hope that our work will create an inclusive space where more black and brown siblings can find comfort and solidarity in learning about resources that are available to them and giving voice to their unique experiences and perspectives to make the sibling community stronger for everyone. Strength through connection. So as I reflect on my journey today, I realize that my story hasn't come full circle. I am thankful for the opportunity to share about my life with you today and even more honored that the Sibling Leadership Network has chosen me to be this year's keynote speaker. I truly appreciate everyone who has joined the conference virtually this year, and especially those who are attending for the first time. It is my hope that you will learn, reflect, connect, and be inspired to keep the conversation going by joining the Sibling Leadership Network and becoming an active member in your state chapter. While we each have come to this conference for different reasons, we are all connected by our experiences as siblings and our desire to support our families and ourselves. We are connected and we are stronger together. No matter what path led us here today, I leave you with a passage from a story I wrote as a contributing author of a book titled Unbreakable Spirit. The road less traveled is the one we create for ourselves and we have the power to be the architect of our lives. Thank you for joining us today on the road less traveled. Enjoy the conference. Thank you, Lisa, for that amazing keynote presentation and sharing your powerful story. Wow. I'm now happy to introduce Richard Mullen, who is the African American Family Support Coordinator at the Ark of King County in Seattle, Washington, who is here today to guide a follow up conversation with Lisa and moderate questions from the audience. Hello, everyone. I am so honored to be here today and um, be a part of this uh, occasion. Um, Lisa, your words carry so much value and weight. Uh, I appreciate uh, the courage in you to share um, a bit of your story and, and, and experience as a sibling and as someone who is supportive in their family and in the community. Um, it's our hope that um, if anyone has any questions that they could put them in the chat and I will try to keep up and uh, Lisa and I will um, fill those uh, as they come. Oh, Lisa, you're getting so much love in the chat. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so Lisa, as the as a, as all of this good feedback comes in, I think I'm just going to ask you a question to break the ice. Is that all right with you? Sure. I think I'm muted now. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. The the uh yeah the unmute is tricky. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um. So Lisa, I, one thing that popped into my head, you had mentioned your brother, Mike, and uh, the situation that happened on two, uh, in 2004 uh, and, and when you know, those charges were brought about. And then later on in your, your speech, you had spoken about um, those charges being dropped in 2010. Was it, was it a, a, I mean, that's, that's you know, a pretty lengthy gap in there um, how is that experience advocating for um, uh, things to be set straight? Um, I, I think a lot of times, Richard, we don't know what we need to know and the power of connecting with a number of the different organizations 
is what led me to know that I did have the power to make those um, charges go away. Um, there was a, I live in Washington, D.C., as I mentioned, um, and there was a story in Virginia that happened where there was another young man that had autism that was facing some very serious charges. And I reached out to that parent just out of support and wanted to let them know about the D.C. Autism Society and how I could um, help her in any way. And what it brought for me was a reality that um, this could actually be a my brother facing a similar story because this individual had other legal situations going on. And um, I knew then that I had to figure out something. And so through connecting with my sibling group and other organizations during that period of my life, someone used the word that I had just never given um, a voice to, which was expunge. So I started just digging deep and figuring out what that process looked like. And I'm so thankful for that because one of the things that has been my biggest concern is because of Michael's behavior challenges is that at some point he could easily be looked at differently for a mere mishap of something that the trust that my mother had with law enforcement um, caused him to create this charge when there was a, with the promise was that they were just gonna defuse the situation and bring him back home. So um, I'm just thankful that that charge no longer exists there and um, any things that we have to face with Michael along the way, that just won't be an issue. Thank you for for leaning into that and weighing in on that. I just I really feel like um, you know that scenario is so prevalent and very seldomly brought up uh, in mainstream forms. Um, so thank you for sharing on that. Yeah, and it was definitely a wake up call. I mean, I sat on the sidelines, and I mean, for me, that was my serious moment that. If I don't step in and try to help figure this out, my brother's situation could be far worse. And when the things happened this past year with George Floyd, um, it just was such a huge, even bigger emotion that I'm thankful that that um, charge has been expunged because I think of all the what ifs and it's a really, it was a really emotional period and just thinking about that whole timeline in this past year. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for shining light on that. We need to hear more about um, uh, those barriers and victories. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, Chloe uh, Hartman wanted to know a little bit more about um, how to uh, set uh, uh, boundaries, positive boundaries. Um, let's see here exactly. Uh, can you elaborate more on establishing boundaries for yourself as a sibling? Um, a shameless plug, I will be doing a table talk later today that's um, titled, um, It's Okay to Back Away. But for me in getting to this point, um, it really required me to break down in order to lift myself back up. Um, I had a period with work where I just wasn't functioning right. There were different things just kind of happening in my personal and professional life that I had to just throw in the towel and say, I just need, to, I just need a time out. And it's not a popular um, choice to make when you have always been that person to do everything for everyone. But one of the biggest things that I've realized um, just in the dynamics of family is that um, I could not fix the situation now and later with my brother. Um, and I found that empowering for myself, but just even more for my mother and brother because they had to step in and step up to make those things happen. Um, and I don't know if I fully answered the question there, but clearly for me, it, it just came to a point where you just break down to have to pull yourself back up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Um, Catherine uh, would like to know, do you think being a member of the SNL was the key factor to the way you separate from your sibling and as well family in a healthy way? Did it help with validation for yourself? Absolutely. Um, and just because I found myself as being the only person of color in the room, what I found was that a lot of the stories were similar and very familiar. Um, and, and going through what we've, ch the challenges that we've had with the pandemic in the past year, CivNet has really been um, a, a source of um, 
inspiration and validation for me, um, especially through the holidays and not being around families and things like that. Just being able to um, read some of the stories and connect in that way and just some of the challenges that other fam families were facing, it just made me feel that um, I made the best decision that I had to in that moment for myself. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so Laura Nichols, uh, she says, thank you, Lisa, my brother, uh, is developmentally disabled. He also happens to be a large black man. There are times when I feel that uh, his disability is not the biggest challenge. I have to deal with exactly. uh, challenge I have to deal with. We live in Canada, and I wonder if you can give some informa information about setting up some sort of legal information site to assist siblings of color. Not an expert in that field, but I would love to be able to connect um, afterwards and maybe just um, connect you with some of the work that we're doing with our BIPOC roundtables as an initial start. Absolutely. And I, and you know, and I think that's why um, the BIPOC roundtable conversations are so important because it's a time for us to share out of our experience and learn from one another. And I really feel like a lot of the answers that we're looking for or are in those conversations and in those conversations. and I mean it really is strength to have those platforms and to be together um so yeah I, I appreciate the um uh, guidance there um okay all right all right uh, okay so I've gone through the chat can if anyone has any questions please Please put them in the chat. We only have moments left. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. All right, so let's see. I guess there are some higher in the, you guys are, I love the participation. The chat is like rolling. <laughs> uh, let's see. Can I flip this and ask you a question real yes. quick, Richard? Yes. For the work that you do with uh, supporting um, African American families in Seattle. Um, if I were to come to you in this space needing support, um, what kind of information would you offer um, coming to you as a sibling and wanting to be able to create a space where I could support my family member? Um, what what things do you do? And okay, so if you were to come to Seattle, um, so I my focus is building up the African American community, community, and so. Uh, that is my, I, 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 my passion, my love. I, although, you know, I love everybody, but um, I just see a lot of disparity in those communities and lack of connection. So if you were to connect with me here in Washington, I would uh, get you connected into a, either a support group that I've created, uh, advocacy group that I've created, or other groups um, uh, that support siblings, that support families that have loved ones with intellectual and physical disabilities. And then the information comes through those connections. So that, that would be my main focus. Absolutely. I actually found a question for you. Um, Stacy Green, uh, she mentioned, or she said, you mentioned that your journey has led you to make a career changes. Can you talk more about that? Um, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, I walked away from from a job that was 19 months and 19 years and six months um, because of a lot of things that were happening with family. And it just made me really take a look at um, aligning my passion with um, connecting with disability support services, uh, with working now with a nonprofit that is aligned just with doing some civic engagement work. Um, I currently work as a chief program officer for that nonprofit, but it has also allowed me um, to just elevate myself professionally in a way that I didn't have voice in the other um, professional um, job that I had for all those years. Um, so I feel like um, just taking that pause and stepping back just really helped me figure out what things mattered to me and to choose what it is I wanted to do versus um, taking a job for the sake of working. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so there actually were a couple of questions uh, in the chat that kind of connected to this next uh, question. Uh, you said that in your first conference, um, 
you really didn't feel connected. Um, what could, what do you feel could have been done uh, to, to better support you in that conference? I know it was um, a predominantly white space. Um, you might have felt, you know, uh, just unseen, not intentionally, but just unseen. And what do you feel that the organization or the individuals there could have done to help support you and maybe others that, you know, uh, could have been there that felt like they just really didn't have a place? Yeah. You know, honestly, I feel like a lot of that was on me in some way. Like I had to figure out how to um, at least raise my hand and say that I was in the room. Um, and I feel like I've had so much growth from that time to where I am today. I feel that a lot of times um, we, we tend to sit back and think that things are supposed to come to us, but there's a responsibility that we also have to have in being able to um, find our, our voice. And so I feel that through the different channels of this path that I've been on has helped me elevate my, myself to be able to find um, my voice to say that I'm frustrated or I'm tired or that this is what I want. And I know that um, the killing of George Floyd last year, I typically will sit in the board meetings for um, the Sibling Leadership Network and I'm quiet. And if there's something that I feel that I have to add a value, I would speak on it. But I know that in that moment for that meeting was one of the first times that I opened up and shared my personal story to where someone reached out to me to ask if I would um, write that statement. And I feel like that's how this whole path has started for me in this past year. Excellent, excellent. Okay, we have Victoria. Uh, she would like to know, uh, how might we better engage police in our community to understand uh, our population? What, what are some thoughts on that? Just, and I think this is coming from your experience with Mike in 2004 and just the advocacy there. Uh, regarding the charges and so on. Yeah, I mean, definitely police training. Um, I, I know that there are a number of things that are happening with uh, different organizations here in DC and I'm sure across um, the country with the climate that we have been in. I don't have specific answers. I have been in and out of different initiatives that uh, different projects have been doing to try to help um, make those connections for law enforcement to better understand the importance of their um, responsibility and being able to engage better with people with disabilities. Absolutely excellent, absolutely excellent. So, so if you're a sibling, and I guess this is this is not, I guess it is a question. Um, if you're a sibling and you're kind of on the fence, uh, and maybe this is your first time here, uh, and you want to get involved, what is your advice? What is your advice? You, you're just you're one because some siblings haven't had a place, and you know maybe never had a place, or maybe they're in their twenties, thirties, later on in life, and they want to get involved and get active. In a community, what would what would you what would you tell them? Um, I can I can speak from my journey and experience. Um, I didn't realize as as much now um, then that I'm a systems person, and mm -hmm. so for me it was it, I needed to figure out um, what it was that that was the disconnect that I had with understanding my brother's diagnosis. What was it about? my mom that I needed to be able to better give her support and to be able to have empathy for what she does. And so I started just kind of branching out. And I mean, as I said too, I went to Google, like I, I went and I just kind of started searching for things. I never thought possible that there was a sibling organization. Um, I never thought that there was a, a unique core group of folks that were just as passionate as I was or had some similar concerns about wanting um, to make sure that their brother or sister with a disability was supported and heard. Um, so it was like magic when I first stumbled across um, a conference that just happened to be in DC. Like it definitely was the universe that put me in that space. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we are gonna go ahead and wrap up the Q&A portion uh, of the conference. But again, I wanted to say, Lisa, thank you so much for your wisdom and sharing your experience, uh, your leadership it is, is priceless. And I've been impacted by you. Um, you're just a phenomenal person, good, great soul, great spirit. And thank, um, you. thank you again. 
Thank you so much, Richard. I appreciate you during this dialogue with me. And thank you, Katie and Amy and everyone in the committee. Really appreciate you guys allowing me to use this opportunity to share my story today. Thank you so much, Lisa and Richard, for that great discussion. And now we're gonna give all of you time to connect with each other in small groups to have engaging discussions. This is a chance for you to share as well as listen and learn from each other. We have moderators that will help facilitate your group and we have guiding questions. Please respect the experiences and confidentiality of other attendees and do not bring any of the personal information that you learn outside of this conference unless you have permission. This session will not be recorded. Please have an open mind and avoid giving advice. We want this to be a safe place for siblings to explore their experiences and feelings without fear or judgment. We'll come back together at 35 after the hour and you'll get a two minute countdown in your small group. And now we'll break into small groups. Welcome back everyone. I hope you had a great conversation in your engaging discussions um, and you made some new connections with people. And um, we are actually going to take a group photo now um, and then we'll, we'll um, have some uh, videos by our sponsors. So for our group photo, we typically do this when we're in person and we're gonna try to do it on Zoom. So please, if you want to be in the group photo, uh, turn your camera on. If you don't want to, um, feel free to keep your, your camera off. And our Zoom director is gonna be taking screenshots of each of the screens with about 50 Zoom squares each um, of all of us uh, for the next minute. So please smile, <laughs> um, ready and go. We're getting our group photo. <laughs> Um, and so now we have a transition time until 45 minutes past the hour. We're gonna be sharing some of our platinum sponsor videos. Um, I also wanna mention that you can find materials of our sponsors in the handout folders. So feel free to listen to the sponsor videos. Um, and uh, then at uh, 45 after we will get started with our sibling panel. Medicaid can't wait. Many people with disabilities are forced to live in institutions with no control over their lives, segregated from their family, friends, and communities. For over 70 years, the ARC has led the fight to close institutions and for funding to support all people with disabilities to live in their homes, in their community, where they want to be. The good news is there is a way to make this happen. Medicaid, a government program, does cover supports for people with disabilities to live independently in their homes while getting the supports they need. It's called Medicaid Home and Community Based Services, HCBS. HCBS helps people with disabilities with everyday activities like working, getting around, taking medications, cooking, cleaning, bathing, dressing. So what's the problem? Right now, the Medicaid law says that the government must cover the high costs for a person with a disability to live in an institution. But the government does not have to cover the lower costs for a person with a disability to live at home in their community. It's a biased and outdated system with too much money going to the wrong place. Because of this, almost 850,000 people with disabilities across the country are on waiting lists to get HCBS services, sometimes for up to a decade, so they can get the support they need at home, not in an institution. Let's fix this together. The ARC needs your help to say, Medicaid can't wait. Everyone deserves to live the life they choose. Join us at thearc.org slash Medicaid can't wait. 
Did you know that Able Now offers a simple, affordable way for people with disabilities to save and invest money? Millions of Americans in all 50 states are eligible. What's more, opening an Able Now account won't jeopardize most disability benefits. Able Now accounts are the result of years of grassroots advocacy to allow people with disabilities to be able to save just like anyone else. It's easy to get started and takes only minutes. Complete the Able Now eligibility quiz to check if you or someone you know qualifies. Eligible individuals can start their savings with no enrollment fee and no minimum contribution, all online from the comfort of home. Regardless of if you're opening the account for yourself or for someone else as an authorized representative, you'll need to share some basic information to complete the application. Be prepared to provide details such as name, address, date of birth, and social security number, as well as link a bank account. Occasionally, applicants may be required to upload additional documentation, such as a government-issued ID or proof of address. After successfully completing your application, you'll receive a welcome email with information on managing your account, including how to contribute funds, check your balance and transactions, and select investments. Your Able Now card will arrive within 7 to 10 business days. Join the thousands of people saving with Able Now by opening your account today. Daymark is a residential community purposely built for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities that's staffed by compassionate professionals that are here to help them live a happy, healthy, engaged life. Well, what made me decide that I needed to create Daymark was that there was no option for Michael after high school. What does Daymark provide for the families and for the residents? I'd say a life. The staff is the most important thing about Daymark. Yes, they're educated in this field and they have a passion for it, but do they really love what they do? Um, and that matters more than anything else, and, and you can't teach that. You can see it online and you can see it in a brochure, but until you come visit and tour and see it in action, you can't fully understand what Daymark is all about and how it could improve their life. GT Independence is a family business. It works for us because we bring our passion for helping people to the business. And it also works because we bring our backgrounds, our professional backgrounds, our training and experience to the business. Having our business tied so closely to um, our own personal lives with, with Ben and with Maggie, self-direction isn't just uh, a career choice for us. We're not a fiscal employer agent because that's a job. It's because we need it done for our own family. We see that need. Um, it's something we live and breathe, not, not just do for a career choice. And it's a really special opportunity that we all get to do that together. So our job is to help people live a life of their choosing, regardless of age or ability. And what that means goes well beyond issuing paychecks or submitting service documentation or doing any of the technical back office things that we do every day. What it's really about is helping people realize their choices and making sure that they have the power to enforce them.